Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group Weekly Roundup for the trading week ending August 26th, 2022. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. This week's theme is who has the bear spray? Well, with Boom Boom Powell, that would be our illustrious uh, Fed Chair Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell. Um, they had their confab meeting this past week out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And for those of you that are not aware, there's a lot of national and state parks out there uh, full of bears. And when you go into any of these bear parks, there's a sign that says for tourists not to feed the bears, of course, but a lot of tourists do, especially from their cars. But also it says if you're going to go out, go out with several um, people in a bunch and carry bear spray. Well, I guess we all needed bear spray for this particular meeting. So without further ado, why don't we just kind of jump in and just kind of take a look at where the weeks were, how they ended up and what's going on and what we can expect over the coming uh, month of September, which, by the way, traditionally is one of the worst months of the year for the S&P and U.S. indexes. As you can see, everybody was in the red for the week, very solid in the red. Dow down 4.22, S&P down over 4, NASDAQ down over 4. Russell was down just slightly under 3%. Year to date, everybody's back in correction and or bear market territory. Very ugly week, two weeks in a row. You can see the performance for the sectors. Energy is still very strong. Um, and I got our members. I highly encourage our members to be playing energy to the long side, especially net gas. You're, you can see year to date, energy has also been leading the way from right out of the gates, first week of January, all the way through. Um, it's up 52.38% for the year. Worst performing sector for the week, obviously, is technology. It was down over 5%. All growth stocks got hit hard this week with the um, uh, data that we got and the read that we got out of uh, Boom Boom Powell and the strong quest to raise rates. You can see communication sectors bringing up the rear for the for the year down 28.64 percent basically a lot of this this week most of the markets move came at the end of the week with the um, Jackson Hole Wyoming uh, uh, annual confab that the feds always put on we had all the fed governors there we had uh, all the central banks Canada Europe UK, Japan, they're all there. I'm sure they're trying to coordinate their efforts. <clears throat> but most of the focus was, as I said, on Fed Chair Boom Boom Powell's speech Friday morning. Very short speech, only about 10 minutes. But his comments were very hawkish. Um, and he perceived taming inflation as the bedrock of, of what they need to do to recover. Um, basically saying that they could experience some pain if they need to do what they need to do. OK, also much of the week's economic data kind of surprised on the downside. All right. Offering even more evidence to the investors that um, uh, growth is uh, slowing, not only here in the U.S., but across the uh, uh, continent or the globe as well. Tuesday earlier this past week, we got the S&P Global announced their composite range of service and manufacturing activity had fallen into correction territory. It hits the lowest level since early 2020, all right, uh, below 50. Um, sales of new homes fell in July. That was for the sixth month in a row. Uh, slowest pace since early 2016. Uh, both personal income and spending rose, much less in consensus expectations. So we're seeing some slow growth there. Consumer savings is slowing down. Uh, credit card usage is going up, which you would expect. Although we've had such a huge move up in home equity va home equity uh, valuations that a lot of consumers are still tapping and spending. So, uh, And that is what the U.S. economy is all about, spending, consumer spending, and willingness to spend. Um, it's almost 70% of the U.S. GDP. Okay. And on a positive note, we did get um, uh, new orders for non-defense capital goods, you know, take out aircraft and things like that. It rose about 40 basis points in July. We did see weekly jobless claims fall back to their lowest level in a month. And the uh, University of Michigan uh, consumer sentiment rose, hitting 58.2 in August. 
after bottoming at a record low of 50 in June. So we're seeing some of that data coming out that while the consumer is very sour on the markets, if you look forward over the next 90 to 120 days, consumers are a little bit more optimistic, okay, thinking that we're we're getting the peak inflation area now and it could come down, but that's still not going to sto- uh, slow Boom Boom Powell and his resoluteness in raising rates. Um, in fact, in speaking of raising rates, the probabilities of a 75 basis point rate hike uh, at the next Fed meeting um, around uh, February or September 21st uh, moved up to over 61 percent. OK, and the markets are forecasting over 85 percent of a probability of rate hikes being over 3.75 percent by the end of the year. The current rate is sitting at about 2.5. So that would suggest another 1.25 percentage point rate hike um, between now and the end of the year. And if you figure we got three Fed meetings, OK, so we have three more Fed meetings and and you're looking at about a 1.25 percent bump, that would suggest September would probably be 75 basis points. Uh, that's what the probabilities are saying more than likely. And then the remaining two in November and December would be 25 basis points each. So that would get us up over a target rate of, of um, 3.75% by the end of the year. Okay. So the markets are now forecasting a lot of that. That's why we saw um, a pretty much uh, solid down move. Uh, and even after the markets closed at 4 p.m., the futures market kept going a little bit and uh, took us down even lower. I'll show you the charts in a minute. Now, if we come over and we take a look at the rest of the globe, you can see everybody was in the red here, too, in Europe. Euro stocks, the FTSE, CAC 40, DAX. In fact, the FTSE is the only bright note year to date, just barely hanging on at 58 basis points, a little over a half a percent um, return in the year. OK, as we kick off um, the beginning of September, we got the minutes from the ECB July policy meeting. They suggested more rate hikes, even put on the table a 50 basis point rate hike for the ECB. Remember, the ECB is running well behind the U.S. as far as number of rate hikes and the aggressiveness of the move. And the ECB is experiencing more economic uh, uh, pain than we are as well. In fact, the forecast is they're probably already in a recession and it's going to be not a pretty one. Eurozone business activity shrank for a second month in a row. Uh, another sign of uh, this uh, recession hitting. Um, we also getting early readings on the S&P Global Composite PMI across Europe. Fell to an 18-month low. They're at 49.2. That's contraction territory. Okay. Um, and over in the UK, business activity is almost stagnated in August. Saw a sharp fall in manufacturing. The uh, S&P Global uh, Composite PMI fell to an 18-month low of 50.9 in the UK. So it is still in a, an expansionary mode, but 50 means there's no growth or no fall in a way or contraction. It's just flat. So that's about where they are. By the way, this is the lowest and slowest pace in the UK in over 18 months. So all in all, not very good over in Europe either. And then, of course, if we move over and focus on the Asian markets, you can see um, Hang Sin was the only one in the green for the week. But year to date, they're all down. Nikkei just slightly in the red um, for the for uh, the year. But in Japan, economic data released earlier in the week really didn't boost uh, sentiment there. Um, their factory activity growth slowed to a 19 month low in August, really being affected by uh higher uh, raw material costs, energy costs, weakening global demand, because obviously they sell their stuff, they export their stuff to the U.S. and Europe. And when the U.S. and Europe slow down, they slow down. Uh, Japan's manufacturing sector, although they're slowing down, expanded just a little bit in August, but it came in at 51 uh, PMI, um, which it was in July, it was 52. So it's slowing down, but it's still in an expansion territory, but almost flat, like kind of like the UK. OK. And then if we look over the uh, Chinese markets, you can see China was down weekly year to date in correction territory. Hang Sen was 
a rare spot of green for the week across all major indexes that we follow is up 2%. China stock markets declined. They're having huge temperature problems, power shortage problems, real estate problems, economic growth problems. And that's why this past week their cabinet came out and outlined a 19-point policy package. <laughs> 19 points, I love it. They added about $300 billion to uh, state policy banks' investments in infrastructure projects, uh, government spending, and that was on top of another $300 billion uh, announced in June. And meanwhile, the People's Bank of China cut a couple of key interest rates uh, trying to shore up efforts in their economy. So all in all, globally, the markets aren't looking that strong, right? Um, and you throw on top of that an aggressive uh, Fed reserve and a resolute boom, boom, Powell and hiking rates near term to slow this economy down to um, actually cut inflation. So they got their work cut out for them. OK, um, if we come over and we look at um, some charts here, let me just show you here. Uh, let's take you over. We're going to take a look at this chart right here. You're going to see the S&P 500 E-mini futures. We ha we have a bear market chart. All right, what's a bear market chart? It's very simple. When the 50 is below the 200 EMA, as you see here on this chart, then you're in a bear market chart. And the challenge points in a bear market chart are quite simple. Again, the 50 EMA and the 200 EMA. And it could also be the 200 SMA too. In fact, if I were to convert this to an SMA chart, the exact almost to the tick of where we pull back here, we're sitting right at the 200 SMA. But the EMAs also work and are programmed in most algos as well. And you can see here, when we we broached the, the 200 EMA, we moved up to the 200 SMA, it totally failed. Uh, and down we go and we found support for one day and we blew below it, we tried to test it, in fact, even we tried to test it on Friday because we had a little bit of an uptick in, in positive mood um, Wednesday and Thursday into Friday, and then we gave it all up again. And not only did we give it up, as I told our members, I said, more than likely, based on what the feds do, we're going to break either up or down on the 200 or the 50, and we broke the 50 down. Now, I got some shaded zones down here, one sitting around 4,000, another sitting around 3,000 as potential um, S1 and S2 support points, um, pivot point one, pivot point two. But you can see here that that's where the odds favor. Now, I will suggest in a bear market chart, it takes many, many attempts and a lot of retests to get through the 50 and the 200 uh, moving averages. It just takes a lot of times to do it. So I believe we could probably find some support near term down here. I do not. We are still, believe it or not, as I've told our members, we're in a buy the dip market. We moved out of the sell the rally market off of these lows down here that we made back over in uh, June 17th, right? So I don't think at this point in time we're going to test those lows. I don't see it happening. I see more of a natural dip process here. Um, and then it could it could actually go even lower, down to 3,900. But I, I believe buyers are going to step in. Probably if it gets down to 3,900, you'll probably see some uh, buyers starting to step in next week, I believe, even though momentum may carry us down a little bit lower. But then I think we're going to grab it and then start moving back up again as we move through the end of the year. I think each subsequent uh, CPI data point. We're getting another one on September 13th uh, before the uh, uh, the next formal Fed meeting, uh, September 20th, I think, or 22nd, sometime 21st time frame. Um, I think it's, you're going to see it succeedingly moving lower. And then Boom Boom Powell, you know, he's done his job. He's, he's talked the markets down a little bit more. But I also want to see a rise in some of the unemployment. Right. You, we're going to need to see some of that because tight labor markets tend to be more inflationary than not. So that's a little bit about what I'm looking at on these charts, guys. Um, if we come over and we look at NASDAQ, NASDAQ was down a bit more. It was down almost 600 points, right, over four and a half percent for the day, actually. You can see NASDAQ 
we actually were able to clear briefly, but we fell back below um, the uh, 50 EMA again, all right? But again, I believe we're on a dip uh, uh, process here. We're not done with the move lower, but I do believe there's gonna be some good opportunities to buy here um, as we um, kinda, it may be another week or so momentum carrying us lower. And then um, I think there's gonna be buyers starting to step in. Again, same with the S&P. I don't at this point in time see us taking out the lows on June 16th when NASDAQ was down almost 34%. Now this is for the 2022 or, or 2022 low, but NASDAQ started moving lower well before um, January 1st, okay? Um, and then of course, if we come down here and, and look at the Dow, the Dow gave up over 1100 points when the markets finally stopped closing here. Dow gave up both the 50 and the 200. You can see the low for the Dow for this year was down about 19%. It's never been in a bear market, um, really. Uh, it's it actually actually hit the low of 19.53. So again, I don't think we're going to hit these lows. I think it's going to move a little bit lower and there'll be a buy the dip opportunity in the Dow. And then finally, the Russell, it was ugly like the NASDAQ. Um, you can see here um, that just on Friday alone, it was down over 3.79%. Um, and, but we're above the 50 EMA. We're still sandwiched. In fact, we tested both almost the 200 and the 50 EMA. So I do believe we'll probably take that down. We'll come down a little bit lower and then we'll have some buy the dip opportunities there. Okay. And of course, if we look at volatility, volatility moved up nicely uh, on the week. All right. Um, and you could see here, every time we've gotten down to the 2019 area in the VIX, since COVID, we've always bounced back up higher. It's just stayed bid. And you can see that big bounce on Friday, all right? Um, and if I were to just move out just a little bit, you can see all of these dips. Once we get down to that area, this is back in uh, June of 2022, it just took off, right? The last time we were solidly around 16 was back in January of this year, right? But outside of that, almost the entire year, when we come down and we hit that 20 area or the high teens, we don't stay there very long and we move back up because buyers are just coming in and, and just using this as an opportunity to buy long volatility um, uh, at these levels here. Okay. Uh, if we look at the front month skew, you're going to see on this front month skew um, that we're still in the green, believe it or not. So the term structure uh, skew for the front month vol, which I'm comparing the VIX to the September volatility futures is in a normal uh, term structure in contango. That's normal. And then if we look at the back month skew, you can see here it's even more in the green. So this tells me that the markets really are not panicking. It's more of a, okay, we know the uh, feds are gonna be hiking. We All we did was just factor in our valuation discounted cash flow models uh, a little bit higher interest rate, 25 bips. So that just caused us to just cut price just a little bit. Well, it was a lot because you look at it for the day. But in the scheme of things, if you were to go back, uh, let's say a year or two from now and put it on a, on, a, on a weekly chart, this would just appear as just a blip or two, right? That's kind of what I'm seeing right now, at least through the end of this year. I do believe we're going to have a bigger pullback than we've had so far this year going uh, in 2023, possibly in Q2, Q3 timeframe. But more on that as we we get more closely aligned with uh, more economic data and going into 2023, okay? Um, if we come down here and look at the bond market, it was essentially flat. Didn't move up much, didn't move down much. It was only on Friday, uh, it was only down four ticks. So interest rates, are going to have be hard pressed to see it move much um, higher. I believe. I think they're going to kind of settle in because the markets are essentially telling the Feds, okay, we think three and a half percent, but we don't believe much more than that. We don't believe you're going to come in there and be even more aggressive than what you did. So Boom Boom Powell wanted to sound very aggressive, more so than he normally does. That's why the markets reacted the way it did. But I don't believe that we're going to see him actually come out and pull the trigger 
and keep raising rates after we get through the end of this year. The markets are making the bet that he's going to be aggressive in September and then pull it back to 25 basis points in November and December. Remember, October is not a Fed meeting month. And then they're going to stand down and give the markets about three months to see where the data goes. That's kind of what the markets are saying right now. Boom Boom Powell kind of iterated on his speech, said he's going to be very aggressive and they'll be data dependent. So that's what the markets are saying. Um, let's see how this thing shapes up. Of course, if we look at the U.S. dollar, all the other currencies suck right now and the dollar is coming back up here. But I do believe it's going to start to run into some issues here. And I would be interested in looking at a long euro, even though they're talking about gloom and doom. And if we come look at the euro, it's below parity right now, right? We've hit my target almost perfectly, and we're sitting on my target. My target was, and it almost hit it to the T, uh, right around 99.9916, right? Um, and with this, I believe it's going to run up and come back up to this level here, right? Uh, which is the 50 EMA sitting around 102. That's where I think the euro will probably move um, over, uh, as we go through the next month or so or a couple of months. That's the higher probability move in my mind. But we don't have a signal and a trigger for that yet, but that would be what I would be looking at. All right. I think the dollar's just gotten about as strong as I see it's going to get for a while. In fact, if we go back to the dollar, you can see here that we're near the, the, the highs for the year around 109.20. And if I were to back it out and put it on a weekly chart, just to give you a little bit of perspective and scope, uh, look at this, right? And let's just zoom out a little bit more. We haven't seen this going all the way back in the dollar since um, right at that little peak right there. Uh, and let me just get this on here so I can actually see what it what it says here. But right up in this area here, back in 2002, coming out of the dot-com crisis. That's how strong the dollar is. Over two decades we haven't seen the dollar index get like this, all right? So that's why I believe we're going to run out of uh, energy here. I mean, the dollar peaked back in um, uh, going into the dot-com bubble. The dollar peaked around a buck twenty, and we're really sitting right now at a buck oh nine. I just don't see us getting much higher than that, right? I, I do not. I mean, we can grant, grant granted, we could see the the momentum carry us up there, right? My target for the dollar, uh, as you can see here, and it shows more plainly on the daily chart, was right around a dollar 109.99. We're at 109.20. If I put it back on a daily, it'll probably show up a little bit better for you. So you can see my target for the dollar right here, right? Let me just zoom in a little bit here so you can see it a little bit better. You can see that gives us a three, four, five Elliott wave. If it probably tops out right in this area here, the MACD will probably roll over. Give us a, a poor man's bud, I mean a bed, which would be a shorting opportunity for the dollar index or a long opportunity for the euro, which is about 58% of the dollar index, right? So that's kind of how I see that playing out. Um, and of course, if we come over here and look at gold, as you guys know, I have been uh, not a buyer of gold. In fact, my gold forecast uh, uh, in the next couple of months is even lower, down around 1,600, about 150 points lower, right? Meaning we're going to take out the 2022 low and move lower. This is a bear chart as well. The 50s below the 200. Now, <clears throat> doesn't mean I'm a perma bear in gold. I do believe there will be an opportunity for gold, just not yet. Same thing with silver. Silver's down. A little bit in the high teens right here. I do believe it can go lower. Uh, my forecast for silver uh, could possibly, uh, let me just kind of look at on here, put it on the chart, take us down even lower, take out the 2022 lows. Um, but if we get much lower than this, I'm going to be interested party in looking at longs and precious metals. Okay. Copper is just a reflection of global growth or lack thereof. You can see here, copper gave it all up right here. Now we're doing this steady, our steady, slow drum beat here. But I do believe copper is going to roll back over again. That's a classic three, four, five Elliott wave pattern with the Elliott wave five projected down here, just slightly or under three, right? So I would see that as a probable move. But if we get over the 50 and it holds, we could run up a little bit higher 
uh, to the 200 EMA and then possibly roll back over. So that's where, and that's just more of a global growth story than anything else. And then of course, if we look at energy, energy's moved up a little bit when OPEC came out and said they may cut production a little bit. I had said energy will probably stay around the mid 80s, possibly to the mid 90s. We've got a good way to trade energy in this kind of environment. Uh, and it's lucrative trade, uh, especially in the futures market. But you don't necessarily have to be in the futures market to play energy. Now, our our mainstay trade has been that gas. We've been long that gas for a while. Uh, you can see here we got a trigger right here. So that does suggest there could be some weakness in that gas coming up probably taking us below the 50 EMA again. Um, but I do like nat gas, right? So that's just a longer term trade through the summer of next year. Get get through the winter here. I think if we get through the winter, nat gas spikes and then coming out of winter uh, in Q1 of next year going into Q2, I think that would be a better time to take your profits and wind down the nat gas trade because it is a little bit extended here, okay? Nat gas in the US, um, very rarely stays up this high for a long period of time. Over in the UK, nat gas is five to 10 times more expensive than it is here. Very expensive product, okay? All right, everybody, that's it for our weekly um, uh, 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 roundup for this week. Members, I will see you Sunday night. We got some nice, interesting uh, stocks to take a look at as well as some uh, option strategies and a few others I think I'd introduced to you last week. So otherwise, uh, everybody else have a great weekend. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. Uh, we're having a great year this year. Next year promises to be even wilder. Um, and we're going to have some fun with that as well regarding volatility. All right, everybody have a great weekend. Members, I'll see you tomorrow night at uh, 8 p.m. for our weekly market watch. Ciao, folks.